invite you to turn to Matthew's Gospel to the 25th chapter. Uh, and I'll begin reading at the very first verse of that chapter. In the early 19th century, there was a British pastor uh, who had a problem. Pastors have all kinds of problems, but he had a problem. And the problem uh, was about the second coming. And uh, he was trying to figure out how the second coming could come at any moment at any time, and yet certain things have to happen before the second coming comes. And presto, a new doctrine was formed, uh, a doctrine of the, what's called the secret rapture. You've seen it in all kinds of movies and whatnot. And that Jesus will come back uh, for his church, and then at a later point, he'll come back with his church. Uh, in other words, there's a secret rapture where every, all kinds of Christians and all those living at that time will be taken away to heaven. Then there will be a seven-year period of tribulation, and then the second coming will happen after that. Christians are raptured to heaven first, and then the world goes on without them, and it gets worse and worse. Now, the Bible does teach a rapture, but it doesn't teach a secret rapture. It teaches a, a meeting of God with, with Christ in the air for those when he comes. But it's far from secret. It's public. It's very loud. It's super noticeable. As First Thessalonians says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. When Jesus returns, he will gather his people, as Jesus has been taught, teaching here in Matthew, uh, from all corners. And he will conquer that airspace, that spiritual space of the air. Remember, Satan is in the, as a kingdom, the ruler of a kingdom of the air. And that's where Christ will be and meet us there. The church will go out to meet their king as loyal subjects were known to do in Jesus' day when their king approached and came uh, and then to escort him back into the, the kingdom. We see this in Palm Sunday that not only are people coming with Jesus into Jerusalem, but people are coming out and meeting him there. We find it in Acts chapter 28 where Paul goes to Rome and the brothers and sisters come out and meet him outside of Rome near the three taverns. We find it even in the text we read this morning that the wedding party comes out to meet the bridegroom. But of course, some Christians trying to solve this problem, which is really non-existent, um, create this idea of a secret rapture. But you might say, but Ron, what about those things that have to happen, like Antichrist and the great apostasy and whatnot before Christ returns? Uh, how could Christ come back today, right now, in this moment? I haven't seen the Antichrist. We don't know how long these things will take place to be fulfilled or how God will fulfill them in minutes, in moments, in what way. But what we do know is that Jesus tells us to be ready, that no one knows when he will turn. We saw that last week. No prophecy experts, no angels, not even Jesus himself in his human nature knows the hour. Only God knows. And Jesus spends about a third of chapter 24 of Matthew and really all of chapter 25 hammering this point home that no one knows it's going to come when we don't expect him. He uses seven illustrations in chapter 24 and 25. Uh, the first one is Noah's day, as we read this, this morning, that people uh, will not know, when, did not know when Noah, the flood was coming. He uses the raiding party illustration of two men in the field and two women at a mill, that a raiding party can swoop down and take one at a moment's notice or the thief in the night, or the parable of the wise and foolish stewards who are left in charge of the, of the master's household. And the master can come back at any time. And now we come to the fifth illustration of, that shows us how Jesus can come at any time. Uh, it's a parable about what's called the tell, parable of the 10 virgins, that's literally what it says in Greek, or 10 young women, five wise, five foolish, 
or even 10 bridesmaids, we might call that. Or as one person put it, I read this week, said five silly girls and five smart and sensible girls. That's a good way of describing it. Um, so let's read this passage. It's a wonderful parable. It's just, it's uh, heart wrenching and, and, and just really, well, I believe by God's grace, touch all of our hearts to, this morning. So this is the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse one. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil for them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was late and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang, ran out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you to take this story that you would use it in our lives, that you would uh, bring it to our hearts, that we might see its implications for us, that you might give us insight by your spirit, help the preacher not to overstate or understate anything, help him to not only say what he means, but that that meaning would be from your, your word and would open our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I remember driving down, I don't think it was Tweedy Boulevard, but it was another one of those th streets in, in Southgate. Uh, uh, and, and I was driving down, I was 16, 17 years of age, and I was driving down and there was this, on the, as I went down the street on the horizon came this big harvest moon probably that was as red as it possibly could be. I've never seen the moon so red before. And I was reading my Bible and it says that the, you know, moon will turn red when the Lord comes back. I thought for sure Jesus was coming. I really did. And that reminded me of a story, a story of Colonel Davenport, the Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives. One day in 1789, the sky at, over Hartford darkened terribly, strangely, like it's never done before. And some of the representatives there glancing out the windows feared that the, the second coming was upon them and quelling the clamor for immediate adjournment, Davenport rose and said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not approaching. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought in. And that's a classic statement of, of Davenport. And Jesus wants all of us to be found doing our duty, found ready when he comes. And so Jesus tells us the story. That's, we know that's the point because that's where he ends in, in verse 13. The story of these 10 teenagers, 10 bridesmaids, I think we could say in our culture, they were waiting for the groom to arrive. Now to understand the parable, we gotta understand some background, right? The, the, the wedding feast obviously is at night. The bridegroom is to come and he's gonna be taking the bride to his home or perhaps his father's home for uh, the, the, to begin the festival, the, the, the wedding feast. And these 10 probably friends of the bride or friends of the family in some way are uh, to, to escort uh, them there. And so you might, you might remember in the background that marriage was not like it is today. There only were, usually were arranged marriages. And so there was an engagement period where the 
bride and groom didn't even show up. It was an engagement with the parents. They would decide what, what's going to happen. And then there was a second stage, which was the betrothal stage, where vows actually were taken, but they didn't go and live with each other. They, they took vows. They were truly married. In fact, they needed a divorce if they were going to break that off. And then thirdly and finally was a wedding feast. And this is what's talked about here, the wedding feast, that third section. It is customary for the, the bride to have her unmarried friends walk with her and provide uh, lighting along the way uh, as they walk to the supper. Uh, it was to be a joyous pr uh, procession uh, by torchlight. Uh, not just to set the mood of, a, you can imagine the beauty of what it would be like, but it was an absolute necessity. Remember, there were no street lights. It was pitch dark at night. It would be like when you're camping and you try to you know, get up to the restroom without a flashlight. You're going to stumble. You're going to stub your toe if you do that. Uh, I've done it before. And you've got to have the light or you're not going to make it. And don't think in terms of house lamps with wicks. These were torches. Now, it uses that word, poles with rags on them, and they would be uh, dipped into oil in a jar. And that would last about maybe 15 minutes or so, and then they'd have to dip the, the torch back into the jar and, and, and relight it. Uh, but the festivals, of course, didn't get started until the bridegroom arrived. And there was no set time for that. We, we, our weddings are all set. You know, the time, place, uh, day, it's all set. These were not uh, that precise. And so it started when he, he arrived. So why the delay? You might be wondering, why would one wait until midnight? It probably was a good sign in one sense, because usually what the, we think, or not positive about this, but, with, but uh, we think that based on other cultures in the time, that the bridegroom was with the parents of the bride during this time, and they were negotiating the last details of the dowry. And so a short period of time for him to show up would mean they didn't argue very much at all. They said, yeah, just take her. <laughs> you know, you can have her. Uh, but a long time, a long negotiation, or having to persuade the parents. That showed that the bride was very valuable. The bridegroom really had found uh, the, the bride, the, the bride. And so that may be why he was delayed. But if the bridegroom was delayed, uh, the, we need to remember that that they all waited for him at that time. And then the story Jesus tells of the bridegroom is definitely late here. He's very late. It's midnight. This is a culture that went to bed at, at, you know, when it got dark, got up when it got light. So midnight was the middle of the night for them. We might go to bed at midnight, some of us, uh, but not them. And so this was in the middle of the night, and these 10 girls fell asleep. And Jesus is making the point that his coming will be at a time we don't expect him. It may be later, much later than we think. It will come at a time, though, when we don't expect it. Like Noah's day, business as usual until it was not. Like the raiding party, you don't know when it's coming. Like the thief that you don't know is coming. Like the servants that didn't know when their master would return. We have to be ready as Christians when the bridegroom Christ comes. We have to be ready anytime, all the time. All right, Ron, you say, Ron, I got that point. So far, so good. But now comes the twist in the story. The bridegroom arrives only to find that five of the, bride, uh, five of the, of the uh, bridesmaids are ready and five of them have no oil. They're not ready. They have no oil and their torches just had what the oil was, was that might have been just there with them. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. We have to get this because I don't think we get the story if we see how bad the problem was. The five with no oil knew at once that they didn't have the oil that they needed. And what do people do when you don't have something and somebody else has it? You ask them, right? Can I borrow your pencil? <laughs> Can I uh, get this? This is what they were doing. And the people, the other five, say no. Get your own oil. And to us, that sounds cruel, sounds kind of cold, right? Aren't we to share with others? Didn't Jesus teach that? Aren't we uh, our sister's keeper? Shouldn't we help out? What happened to do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Is it a time to give, is Jesus staying in, time not to give? Is that the point we should get from this parable? 
Why are these five rewarded for their selfishness? You could look at it that way. Now, remember, parables are not allegories, or not usually allegories. And Jesus is not making an ethical point here. That's not his point. He's telling a story to make a point about readiness, about the absolute necessity of readiness, that we must be ready when he comes. And no one, no one can get ready for us. I can't get ready for you. You can't get ready for me. You can't get ready for your kids. You can't get ready for your friend. We can't prepare for others, and we can't have them prepare for us. We each must be ready to meet the Lord. And so the point of the parable is not making an ethical point. It's not trying, it's not a lesson on the golden rule. It's about being prepared. And we need to remember that in this day, because some people would emphasize the church so much that we think we're saved because we're in the church. As long as we're with people that are believers, then we'll be fine when Jesus comes. This story uh, contradicts that. One person put it this way, sure, we need church fellowship when mature believers, means of grace for us. But here Jesus places individual responsibility before us. As one scholar put it, now suddenly everything is terrifyingly individual. They're not ready because they're with the other five. And so to understand the point of the parable, we have to see just how unprepared these five bridemaids that didn't have the oil are and the consequences of their unreadiness. It's not like, you know, in a wedding, things get busy, right? You've been in weddings before and people forget things, yes. Uh, Maybe you, it's it's not like forgetting lipstick saying, I forgot my lipstick, can can I borrow yours? This is not what's being conveyed here. It's like forgetting your, as a bridesmaid, to order your dress and then asking another at the wedding to borrow her dress. That would be the, the kind of parallel to what this means. For to not have oil is to mean they jeopardize having light in which it possibly could, and there was no light, it would, it would ruin the wedding. It's like saying we didn't make any food for the wedding. We were kind of busy this week. Oh, we don't have a cake for the wedding. You know, we just, just forgot that one. Sorry, could you please, please forgive us? No, that's unforgivable in a wedding context. And they speak with no oil because what, what would happen is if they spread the oil for five over ten, then the may, all ten may run out. And that's what they're worried about, and there would be no light. You see, the five with oil are not being mean. They're not being stingy. They're being realistic. They're being loyal to the bridegroom. The five without oil are being totally negligent. They should have had that with them. They they showed that that they didn't take the role, their role in, in the wedding seriously at all. So don't feel sorry for them. If you are, <laughs> I was a kid you know, when I heard this in Bible, Bible school and thought, oh, so why didn't they give them something? That's not very nice. That's not the point. They showed that they had no regard for the bridegroom or the bride or the wedding. They showed that they were not ready. They showed that they were not just thoughtless and careless, but they were heartless and faithless and loveless. They were utterly unfaithful. And so the five foolish bridesmaids have no other option but to go find some oil someplace else. And good luck with that at midnight, right? Uh, so the story doesn't say, though, whether they found that or not. That maybe they, they did, maybe they didn't. It doesn't tell us that. Uh, but it really doesn't make any difference. The foolish five showed who they were really were and what they really thought of the bride and the bridegroom in the wedding. And they still want to come into the feast. They come knocking on the door, sir, sir, but are turned away. The door is shut. Jesus is showing there's a time when the door will be shut. The door is wide open now for everyone to come in, to come to Christ. But there's a time when the door will be shut. 
Remember, the parable is not about showing mercy. It's not about grace here. It's about being ready. It's too late to get prepared now for these young women. It's, it's too late to be faithful so they won't get in. And the bridegroom says, I don't know you. Now, surely the bridegroom did know them. He was not being literal there. The point is, he probably known them from childhood. They were part of the wedding party. He knew who they were. But by their disregard for him, they were strangers to him. They estranged themselves from him. It was a way, actually, that phrase was used by rabbis sometimes. They would say the same thing, I don't know you, it was a way of saying, I don't welcome you, I don't receive you into my fellowship of my disciples and my followers, my students. And so you might be thinking, well, do people really want to get into the kingdom and God doesn't let them? Again, the point is not that they want in, but that they want in on their own terms without being ready, without being faithful, without being what is necessary to come in. Uh, D.A. Carson said it well. He said, because this parable concerns the consummation of all things, the refusal to recognize or admit the foolish virgins into the wedding must not be construed as callous rejection of their lifelong desire to enter the kingdom. Far from it. It is the rejection of those who, despite appearances, never made preparation for the coming of the kingdom. Remember Jesus said to those who had done things in the kingdom, miracles and whatnot, I tell you, I never knew you away from me. In essence, they want to crash the party is why they want to come in. They don't belong because they never have belonged. They show that they don't belong by their unwillingness to be ready in the first place. They think that they can be unfaithful and still come in. They think that they can be disloyal and still be part of the wedding supper of the Lamb. They thought it didn't matter. Didn't thought, didn't matter what they did or how they treated the bridegroom or the bride. But it does matter. Jesus said at one point, whoever does not do the will of my Father in heaven is, everyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother, implying the opposite. If we don't, we aren't really part of the family. Or in this case, we're not part of the wedding. And the sobering part of the parable is that the 10 bridesmaids are so similar. They all have lamps. They all have some kind of relationship to the bridegroom. They all are waiting. They're all together. They all sleep soundly. They all are surprised when the bridegroom appears, but only five of them are ready when that happens. Only five. Only five were wise and had the oil and were ready. You see, it's a, it's a sobering message to us that it's not how we look to other people that matters. Appearances don't matter. It's not how we act in front of other people when we're with Christians. It's whether we love the bridegroom. It's rather, whether we love Jesus and we know that he loves us. We know, it's whether we know that he knows us because we've said, Lord, save me, come to me, forgive me, make me new. You see, we, we've got to be careful. This is always so careful because there's one side that would say, hey, we're part of the church, we're confessing Christ. Hey, what's the big deal? And Jesus is saying, that's not enough. Jesus is saying, you can be part of the party and not really make it to the wedding supper. The other side is to say, well, we don't need the church at all. And both those sides are wrong. We need the church. We're saved through the, 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 the preaching of the word and we, the fellowship and the means of grace. 
But we need to remember in all of that that we need to love the bridegroom. We need to love him and want his ways in our hearts. Or we're really not going to be ready. We're not going to be ready at all. And so uh, one person put it this way, when Christ comes, it will be too late to reverse a life of neglect. In other words, it will be too late to get sanctified. It will be too late to get holy. It will be too late to, to work on your faith and to work on your perseverance. It will be too late to do all those things when Jesus comes. Now is the time to get ready. The question of this parable is for all of us. Are we ready? Are you readying yourself now? One engraved tombstone said, I expected this, but not just yet. That sounds written on a tombstone. It's going to come. The Lord will either come to us or we will come to him. The question is, are we ready? Now, how do you know you're ready? How do you know you're ready to meet the Lord? And again, this is tricky. Because if I say one thing, you might think something else. If I say this, you might think this. I think Charles Spurgeon was great when, in this parable. He uh, says this. A great change has to be wrought in you far beyond any power of yours to accomplish. You must first of all be renewed in your nature or you will not be ready. You must be washed from your sins or you will not be ready. You must be justified in Christ's righteousness or else you will not be ready. You must be reconciled to God or you won't be ready. You must have a lamp and that lamp must be fed with heavenly oil and it must continue to burn brightly or else you will not be ready. No child of darkness can go into the place of light. You must be brought out of nature's darkness into God's marvelous light or else you will never be ready to go with Christ to the marriage. So to summarize that, we need to put all of our faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Every bit of our faith is in him, not in ourselves. And this is gonna sound like a second, but it's really a follow through of the first. And then because of this, we're pursuing faithfulness to Jesus all life long. That's the Christian life. We're not saved by the Christian life, but if we truly are putting our faith in him and him alone, there's no other course for us but to begin to become faithful. And that means changes, that means painful repentance, that means uh, uh, putting to death sin in our lives, or we won't be ready. We won't be ready. Think of this illustration. Suppose a mother wearies of nagging her messy child to keep her room in order. She resolves, resolves that she will permit her to do as she pleases in her room, but that her child must submit to random inspections that have real sanctions. After a good inspection, the allowance is doubled. After a bad inspection, it's eliminated. The messy child wails, how can I be ready for random inspections? There's only one way. She must be ready for the inspection at all times. She must be, make her bed the minute she gets out. She must put her clothes away in the, hand, the laundry as soon as she takes them off to be ready. Are you ready to meet the Lord? If he came back this afternoon, are you ready to meet him? The final question this morning, I'll close with this. The final question is, what does readiness look like for you today? For you this week? You in this season of your life, at this time of your life, what does readiness mean? What isn't ready that you need to make ready in your life? For when Jesus comes, we must be ready. I remember my dad, uh, one time he, he got held up by some robbers in his store. He had a store down west of LA. He was robbed a couple of times. One time he, they got him in the back. Fortunately, they didn't hurt him or anything. They stuck a gun in his face and uh, said, just stay there. Tell us where the money is. Tell us where the money. Well, my dad had money hidden all over that place. It was like 50 places there was money. Uh, but he would tell one at a time, you know, go over there, there's money over there. But as they were trying to get his money, 
He looked at the man. He said, I'm ready to meet the Lord. Are you? As a little boy, I was just so proud of my dad. And he would stand up for the Lord Jesus and try to and, and have empathy for this man in the midst of being robbed. But that's the question all of us have to ask, answer. Are we ready to meet the Lord? Let's close in a word of prayer together. Lord, we ask that you would help us to ready ourselves, to be honest with ourselves, to be honest and not deceive ourselves, to ask ourselves, do we have the priorities of the kingdom or are we marching to different orders? Do we listen to your word or do we think it's for other people? Lord, help us to ready ourselves that we might be truly ready when you return. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.